Good afternoon and welcome everyone to the Straits Times Through the Lens webinar on the art of communicating climate science. I'm Audrey Tan, Science and Environment Correspondent at the Straits Times, and with me today are three maestros from the Art Desk. We have Art Editor Lee Hup King, and Executive Artist Manny Francisco and Billy Kerr. They are among the artistic minds behind the video that we saw right before this webinar, and if you missed it, you can always check it out again at the National Museum. The video and webinar is part of Through the Lens, a photography exhibition jointly organised by The Straits Times and World Press Photo. It will run until the 6th of February and admission is free. On that note, we would like to thank our venue supporter National Museum of Singapore, outreach partner Singapore Press Club and logistics partner Trinity Cargo Link. First, allow me to share some housekeeping matters with our audience. This session will be about 45 minutes long and for those who are joining us via Zoom, do send us your questions by clicking on the Q&A icon on your Zoom screen. A recording of this session will be made available online on the Straits Times website. Now, over the past year, the world has not only had to deal with COVID-19, it has also had to grapple with the impacts of climate change. Wildfires, floods, heat waves. We also heard the United Nations declare a code red for humanity following a sobering report from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change about the state of the climate. But how should the scientific reports be communicated? And how can we relate these international reports to the Singapore audience? That's where art meets science. And today, we will hear from the experts themselves. 
But before we begin, let's hear from them and uh, maybe Harp, you can kick us off by telling us more about yourself. Hi, uh, thanks for having me, Audrey. Uh, my name is Harp. Um, right after school in the US, I majoring in illustration and advertising. I joined uh, the new paper. That was back in 88. So it's almost 34 years now. So in the new paper, I dabble in uh, illustrations, uh, information graphics, and cartoons. And in the early years of new paper, I, my love was in cartooning. But as time goes by, I realized uh, I started uh, dabbling in information graphics, which I find very challenging because uh, we are in the business of newspaper and piecing together news uh, using graphics is uh, alluring to me. After that, uh, I went to marketing uh, for a couple of years and then uh, recently I joined the Straits Times. And in New Paper and Straits Times, I was the art editor. So currently I have a team of almost uh, 21 people below me. And uh, what we intend to do uh, in Straits Times is uh, to bring all these uh, wonderful print graphics to life through animations. and. Uh, other means. La. So with me are my colleague uh, Manny and Billy la. and they are the minds la, behind uh, the thing we are trying to push forward this year making cartoons come alive. So we'll come back to that later in yes. the course of the webinar but Manny maybe you can also tell us a bit more about yourself. Yeah I'm a senior uh, executive uh, art uh, a senior art executive for the uh, ST Art and um, I've been you know, doing editorial cartooning for uh, political cartoons for 29 years already. And I'm a vis uh, visual communications graduate from the uh, University of the Philippines. And then I've been with ST for almost 14 years now. Yeah. Thanks, Manny. And last but not least, Billy. <laughs> Hi, uh, I'm Billy Kerr. Uh, I'm an uh, executive infographic journalist in ST. Um, Unlike my colleagues here, I think I'm the most junior. I think uh, I'm closing in 10 years in SPH. Well, I studied animation in DigiPen, um, but I've been like drawing most of my life, I guess. And since young, I guess animation and cartoon and movies and stuff is just has been my thing, la, has been my passion. So I guess it's great that I can be in a job that you know, does this stuff. Okay, thanks Billy. So now the medium of communication using infographics has been a newspaper staple over the years. I mean, Harp, you mentioned this earlier. Um, but why is art important in communication? And how has it changed over the years that you have been in this business? Uh, when I first started in SPH, uh, we are predominantly a print uh, newspaper. But after three decades here, I've seen the growth and the change in uh, news medium. Um, Nowadays, people no longer have time, you know, because of all the distraction that we have. We have uh, social media, you know, we have TV, we have Netflix now, you know, we used to have Starhub cable and so forth. But right now, with Netflix and everything else, uh, the readers are no longer, you know, uh, they no longer have time. So they want things and news uh, fast. And we have to do all we can to catch their eyeballs. And and they want news in a very uh, attractive and uh, uh, nugget size, bite size news. We have uh, we have to contend with uh, uh, competition from uh, IG, TikTok, and uh, and Facebook and so forth. So in for graphics, we have to think of other ways where we can present graphics, uh, not in the still form, but uh, in a very engaging form of uh, visualization and we have uh, so far uh, tried out animation which I think has uh, worked pretty well in, uh, in our favor and last year we embarked on uh, a journey to bring all our print graphics to life. In my department we have very talented artists you know and my quest is to Think of how I can bring cartoons 
political, political cartoons, editorial cartoons, uh, illustrations, and use them to explain hard news, such as uh, like the one we recently did on Jama'a Islamia Terror Network. We have uh, climate change cartoons and so forth. So the challenge for my art department this year is to uh, bring it to life. Lah. And only through animation can we penetrate the social media and also probably uh, our own website and ch channels, SD channels. So I think you hit the nail on the head. Um, yeah. Attention spans are getting shorter. Yes. People want bite-sized news yes. and there's so much competition from so many other media outlets and uh, social media outlets um, That's everywhere. Right. That's right. So when it comes to change, I mean you mentioned animation a few times and Billy, you are ST's animator. So yeah. tell us more about you know, the process of animating and how you know, the digital revolution has provided us with more tools for communication. Um, like like I mentioned, I guess um, comparatively to like print graphic, animation is definitely a great tool to showcase this, like you said, like more technical stuff. Because, I mean, like if, if you see it like a printed ad and then compared to like a TV commercial, the fact that you can see things move uh, really helps sell the idea, really, really helps bring like things, uh, the whole idea to life. So in a way, it catches people's attention more. La. So I guess uh, it is definitely a very good medium to show off you know, some can be can be political ideas, can be social issues and stuff. Okay. Yeah. So now let's take a look at some examples. Um, now that we have established the importance of art and the different tools that we have in, in our arsenal in communi <coughs> communicating climate science. So um, recently, um, in the lead up to COP26, the United Nations Climate Change Conference in November last year, the Straits Times Science and Climate and uh, worked with the Art Desk to come up with a series of climate change cartoons that kind of conveys the various themes involved in climate change discourse. And the video showing on your screen now actually shows a video of adaptation. Um, and what exactly does this mean? It is Adaptation is a concept that uh, is used in climate change discourse to talk about how humans are adapting to the impacts of climate change. So in Singapore, we are familiar with sea walls to keep away rising sea levels. We are familiar with indoor farming to improve our food security because um, in indoor farms, you are less susceptible to changing weather patterns, changing rain patterns. And these are terms that you know we have written about a lot in print. But we thought that maybe we should try to make them more accessible, easy, more easy to understand through to graphics and this ran over four weeks in print in a, in a cartoon panel and also we animated it for the digital realm. So now I'm gonna uh, look at the text that we gave Manny, how he interpreted the, the text that we gave him and converted it into this beautiful graphic that we just saw. Yeah, on the first frame actually, you know, about adaptation, right? So <clears throat> adaptation and I, I tried to encapsulize visually how we, you know, how would we see adaptation? I mean, there was a suggestion uh, that I do a, a shield, but right? the shield is quite small. So I, I uh, tried to uh, come up with, uh, you know, an, an armor. It's like a second skin, you know, to protect ourselves from, from the dangerous elements. So that's how I came up with the, the armor idea. Okay. Yeah. So, but a comic strip is, of course, not just one image, but a series of panels. So, is there a, yeah. a science of determining how many panels to use? How you convey all these concepts? Of yeah, everything is based on actually on the uh, the text, right? And uh, I was also lucky enough to be given reign on uh, how I would uh, lay out the cartoons. So, so what I did was, uh, of course, the the usual cartoon panels are just the square types, right? So what I did was really understand what is the main thrust of each uh, you know, uh, episode. So like in the first episode, right, uh, it, it's an introduction of uh, what is uh, climate change. So how would I you know, make this interesting? I kind of just do you know, square, square things, right? Square boxes. So what I did was, um, so in sense, this is about the earth. So I did was what I did was make the globe uh, like a pivot visual, uh, and then around it are the uh, the minor uh, uh, panels. So it, it 
in composing, there, there's some main main uh, visual, and then around it are minor visuals. The so main yeah, yeah, yeah. And we even managed to squeeze some trivia about what causes the Yeah, movie. yeah. Yep. Uh, just just to make uh, it's like a breaker, just to make uh, uh, some uh, certain illustration interesting and relevant. So now a bit of a behind the scenes nugget. Um, this cartoon series was done within a very, very short time span. I think we yeah. had four comic strips that ran over the month of October in the lead up to COP26, which was in the beginning of November. And you know, there was a, there was a chain of events, right? So we gave mm -hmm. many the text and then many uh, translated that into art. And then Billy had to animate it. So I think you ended up pulling very late hours, right? Tell us more <laughs> about the process behind it. Yeah, because uh, as an animator, I must first basically get the elements from many. So once he has fixed all the poses, I will have to from there I'll have to figure out how each of these frames can be broken can, can be broken down into animation. So like oh which head, which arm need to move, which the water has to rise up and down and stuff like that. So um, that, that I mean to be honest, the thinking process of trying to figure out what animation goes where will take up a bit more time compared to the actual execution. Uh. Yeah, but uh, yeah because. It's, uh, it's a four-week thing, so maybe at first it was quite rough, but after, after a while, it gets a bit better. And for, for animation movement, I guess, uh, it helps. Right? Because like I said, I watch cartoon a lot. <laughs> so I guess watching all this cartoon helps a bit in like, trying to figure out what, what is appealing to people. Yeah, and, and what you know, can add a bit of humor in there, if possible. Sometimes we'll, I'll have to ask Manny to help draw some extra stuff that will, you know, spice up the, the Any animation. examples that you can cite? Like, what are, what are the things that you had to get Manny to draw in order to animate them in a realistic manner? Um, For the climate change cartoons you... Like, mean? let me see. Is... Which one? Uh, like, there, there are some frames... I mean, I would say, like, like, because animation is... There are some certain parts where it requires certain movement. La. It's, so... If if like there's a character on this particular pose and he needs to turn, sometimes I'll need to ask many to go back and draw some extra stuff. Yeah, yeah. those are called in between. Uh, yeah, in images. between. It's just stuff. like the things that we used to play when we were kids, and then you had to flip the pages. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Flip the exactly. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> okay, yeah. so I think the best way to highlight, uh, you know, this artistic process behind words is just to put many on the spot by getting him to draw something, uh, in real time. So, uh, many, how will you <laughs> interpret this, um, within one? Oh, okay. Day? Uh, let me try. Okay. Mangroves, Mangroves okay. are natural habitats that can protect human societies against sea level rise. Okay, let me try. Um, so, so first I would try to really understand the, uh, what's, what's the concept. Mangroves, okay. And then the key words would be protect and man mangroves against sea levels. Okay, yeah. let me see what I can do. So just to give the audience a bit of background, um, when it comes to protecting against sea, I mean, since we were talking about adaptation just now, I thought this would be a good example to bring up because mangroves are a natural habitat that has the ability to keep pace with sea level rise if the rate of sea level rise does not increase too rapidly. And the reason why they're such a good nature-based solution is because of their roots. Um, if you've gone to a mangrove, you can see how they, um, they're, they're, the mangrove roots are like sticking out from the ground. And because of this ability, they can actually trap sediment from the tides as they ebb and flow. And that helps the mangrove keep pace with sea level rise to an extent. So countries, including Singapore, are trying to see how we can harness this nature's superpower to kind of protect parts of our coastline against sea level rise. Um, and in Singapore, you can find mangroves in places like uh, the northwestern coast, a huge uh, an area with huge um, swaths of mangroves in Sungai Buloh Nature Reserve, but you can also find them in Pulau Ubin, and Changi. So this is, this is really a scientific concept. I mean, the, the technical term that people often talk about is nature-based solutions. So I think there's no better way to understand this than, than through artwork. This is anyway. just going to be a rough... Uh, yeah, sure. You know. I mean, it only have a minute, so... Yeah. Okay, <laughs> so roughly, I will be drawing the, uh, the, the mangrove, like, you know, Make it, give it some human elemental, you know, element uh, emotion, like. Oh, like a hug. Uh, like, uh, yeah, protection, right? Yeah, that's yeah. the one of the words. Okay. Against uh, the elements, okay. So 
I saw that you were trying to identify what were the keywords. Yeah. Oh, I like this concept of a hug. It's really, I think it really encapsulates the crux of the issue. Mm -hmm. Let me do something like that. Oh, that's nice. <laughs> a mangrove tree and circling. Yeah. A uh, human. Uh, uh, you know, the roots uh, are like uh, arms protecting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, I think that's great. Something like that. So as we see, art can be a very powerful tool in communicating concepts. But then again, it's also important to contextualize it to our audience, right? Yeah. Um, for example, we know there's a lot of science communication done in the US and Europe on mm -hmm. climate change. So how do we make it relevant for Singapore? I mean, hard, as art editor, you often have to conceptualize a lot of these kinds of artwork. And actually, over the weekend, we just did one together, right? A board game concept on right. the 22 ways for the 2022 mm -hmm. on how individuals can actually contribute to nudging the green transition along or nudging, making the world uh, more environmentally friendly, right. more environmentally conscious. So what was the, when planning, when planning out the graphic, when conceptualizing it, what, what was going on uh, in your head? So I think when I first read your script, uh, you mentioned you have 22 steps, right? So 22 steps, um, so I was thinking hard, how to translate 22 steps into something that is appealing to readers, you know? Of course, a lot of things were playing in my mind, you know, we could do so many things. Uh, we were thinking of Sting and Ladder, we were thinking of, uh, I was thinking of Indiana Jones, you know, how he uh, managed to o overcame all the obstacles to attain the final uh, uh, statue and so forth. So a lot of things came to, into my mind, you know. Uh, with past experiences, it plays a crucial role in uh, developing concepts, you know. So all my life experiences come into play, you know, uh, from movies I watch, you know, TV shows, uh, books I read, and comic books even, you know. So all these rush into my mind and I'm just trying to decipher your information and come up with the best concept. I think in the end, ultimately, it is about um, something that appeal to the local readers and who doesn't like board games no? everybody has played board games in their life so we finally settle on a board game a combination of thing and leather plus maybe indiana jones and of course lara croft lara croft tomb raider came into yeah. play you know we are thinking of national treasure and all of course it's a combination of all of that and and to make the person running across the page alone is uninteresting. So I was thinking, you know, it's like a maze. She will have to run up and down. You know, I was thinking of up and down, side to side. Come so, on, brother. Uh, yeah, yeah, so it, it adds to the dynamics of the game, you know. And it poses some challenge also. And I engage many because I think his style suits this particular concept. And based on the time frame that I had, I think many could pull this off. And for Billy, I wanted Billy because Billy is a seasoned animator. And Billy has a background of uh, being an avid movie buff. And for an animator, you need to have that background. You may have seen the nuances in the video, you know, the superhero landing, you know. He probably has seen a Marvel <laughs> movie. Right, or the Matrix, and he has incorporated what he has seen into the board game, right, into the animation. Although it may seem so tiny, the details, but audience can relate to that. So it gives a little flavor, our own, uh, it, it, our own uh, take on how this superheroine lands on that particular table, you know. Uh, so these are not, the details, yeah, yeah. and these are not by chance. You know, everyone I selected for this particular project has their role to play. So are they the official ST climate cartoonists now? 
<laughs> yes, I think <laughs> sort of. Yeah. Of course, we will cultivate more of that. Yeah, yeah. More of them. Yeah. More collaborations. Also. Yeah. I remember. I mean, just to share uh, share with those watching. Um, in the process of coming together to do that board game, we were considering like, okay, maybe we shall do Mayan Temple. Then we realized, okay, not very relevant to the That's Singapore right. audience. That's and right. then maybe we thought, maybe what about the coal factory? Because we want to contextualize individual action within the grander scheme of systemic change that's needed right. to, to tackle climate change, which yes. is mainly caused by state and corporate actors. Then why, why not a coal plant? Because uh, not many of us have seen the inside of a coal plant, right? And the coal plant, is, it looks like any other Tuas factory, actually. <laughs> so, yeah. you know, it looks like an incineration plant. You know, it looks like any plant. So, you know, readers may not relate to it. But in the end, we said, okay, by not having a coal plant, we could bring this uh, game indoor and outdoor. You know, so this particular heroine could actually went underground, could actually go underground. You know, could actually fly on a yes. plane to the sky, on the water, and so forth. So it it gives more scope for many to draw, and makes it much more interesting. Yeah. So on that note, why why a heroine? I mean, you were talking about Indiana Jones and all these male-centric characters. So why did we finally see a heroine in, in the final outcome? I think perhaps many can answer that question. From the start, we were already talking about, you know, some someone, a female, edgy type of uh, character. And uh, we did a lot of studies, right? We bounced ideas. And uh, we ended up with this uh, Lara Croft, uh, image which really su suits the uh, you know the, the whole concept of uh, adventure you know we want to see her like uh, she seems to be like in a, in a mission right kind of thing uh, character yeah, yeah. Yeah, and Hart, when we were chatting about this, um, like this heroine you were mentioning, you wanted to you know channel some female power because oh, yeah. a lot of not not a lot of female representation in those superhero movies nowadays. As you know, the board game is um, is like I mentioned earlier, you know, it's it's like uh, National Treasure, Indiana Jones, and as if you have seen Hollywood movies, they are predominantly very male centric, right? And and we wanted to inject some uh, female protagonists like Harley Quinn, for example, you know. And we thought that, okay, for climate change, for a change, you know, no pun intended, let's have a girl. <laughs> yeah. A girl that faces all these challenges, yeah. right? And it's far more interesting than having a guy this time. And it turned out really well, right? We have the, we have the ponytail, you know, flapping the wind and so forth. I think it's also fun for many, uh, for Billy to animate, Yeah. right? Yeah, <laughs> secondary action. Yeah, the ponytail, the ponytail, you know, and the backpack and so <laughs> forth. Yeah. Well, I think it's definitely appreciated, you know, to yes, to, yes. to be more inclusive in our right. communication. Mm -hmm. But I think one other way that we try to to make um, scientific concepts relevant to our audience is also to try to use characters that people can identify with, right? And um, for example, in our climate tune series, our narrator was a black neck Oreo. So this character was very specifically chosen because it's a bird, it's an urban bird that many of us would have encountered. You would have seen it in your parks and gardens. You would have seen it flying across the street. So this is one bird that I think everyone in Singapore would have encountered um, sooner or later. You don't even have to go into the deep into the nature reserve to see it. So we also feature an Arctic squaw. So the black Nick Oreo was the main character main narrator throughout like three or four of our, our series, uh, I mean throughout our cartoon series. But we also had an arctic squaw, a migratory bird that really makes an appearance in Singapore. And we chose it because I thought that it would be a good voice to tell our native resident bird about, oh you know, the troubles and uh, the things, the wildfires, the melting ice that he has seen on the journey from the far north all the way down to Antarctica. So, I mean, these are just some examples of like characters that, that we use and suggest. But of course, then it's up to many to cartoonize it. So, do yeah. you have to... Uh, do research. Like, how do you ensure that it's scientifically yeah. accurate when you know... Yeah, I did a lot of research, actually. Uh, a thorough research. I googled the images, actually. And uh, uh, did some studies. And of course, showed some studies to you for, for approval, right? I mean, if it's recognizable as a SCUA or, uh, you know... So yeah, so we ended up with uh, these images. Yeah, 
So another interesting thing was for the Arctic squall, after, after Manny drew out the cartoon, we actually fact-checked it with an ornithologist yeah. just to make sure that it was scientifically accurate. Yeah, um, recognizable, and, right? Yeah, and initially we had placed the Arctic squall like in a forest setting. But later we were told that actually the Arctic squall is mainly seen like in open bodies of water. So we kind of changed the concept to two birds perching on the tree like without, it's not super forested. So mm. just to make sure it was a bit more scientifically accurate also. Yeah. Okay, so um, I think we have lots of questions from our audience. So just one final question for you, Hub. Um, Artdesk has been very active in producing a lot of climate change comics and animations over the past couple of months. What else can we expect going forward? Well, <laughs> well um, we, have a, we have a few good illustrators. You know, um, what, what I mean by illustrators means uh, people who can draw you know, uh, real life drawing uh, so I intend to put this. Uh, I intend to bring them to life, lah. I've tested with the JI, the network terror thing, and I think it worked really well. You know, uh, aside from cartoon, I, I I think this is one area that we can actually uh, bring to life, lah, through animation, because we have a lot of hard news, you know, and I foresee uh, more of this in the coming months, and uh, and something that actually can complement what ST Digital is doing right now. You know, uh, we can actually soften the hard news so that it's more palatable to uh, younger audiences. Uh, and I think it's a very important first step la, for Straits Times. Yeah, definitely. I mean, we may have started out as a newspaper, but mm. the audience now consumes everything digitally. So we just got right. yeah, right. So we can expect to work you guys much harder <laughs> in the I coming months. <laughs> I also want to add that uh, um, it's probably in these regions uh, we are probably one of the first to actually uh, try this out using illustrations you know, to animate. Uh, I, I think this will actually uh, open up a new frontier for Straits Times and I foresee uh, very interesting things to come in this uh, coming year. Okay. Now I'm super excited <laughs> <laughs> and definitely you guys must stay tuned and watch out for future upcoming cartoons and animations. But now let's take some questions from the audience. Um, one question that was pre-submitted was this. How do you guys internalize and digest the news and come up with such an insightful comic in such a short time? I think may maybe many of you can take this um, using climate tunes. I think climate, climate change cartoons, we only gave you the text days before it was due for publication. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Sorry. Well, <laughs> actually, it's it's uh, it's kind of hard to uh, come up with ideas, you know, in a short uh, period of notice. But I've been doing illustrations for twenty nine years, so um, yeah. It's sometimes it's there are fast fast days, there are slow days, and uh, if I'm really interested in the project, it would be very fast. I would come up ideas automatically in a snap. And sometimes I would need time, you know, I would need to process uh, the text and do research, understand the concept before I come up with a visual. Yeah. So if you could give um, someone who is starting out uh, cartooning for the first time or trying out infographics for the first time, what tips would you give them? If they were to read something and have to come up with, with an artistic concept? Oh, um... Like maybe just now you were looking for keywords, right? Yeah. Do research, um, fish for ideas, look at other cartoonists' uh, style. Um, you know, it's like reading a book, you know. Read a book, read the, or look at other cartoonists' style, what works, what doesn't work, and, uh, and adapt, you know, adopt, I mean, uh, you know, the, why, why their cartoons are effective. So yeah. watch a lot of movies, right? I mean, I watch a lot of cartoons, <laughs> Cartoon Network, you know. <laughs> Just read, read, uh, read, uh, yeah. And learn from other cartoonists also, you know. You, you, being a cartoonist, you don't, you don't have to be in a vacuum. You, know, you have to have, uh, you know, other people's ideas also. Yeah. yeah. I think even for journalists, um, like in terms of presenting something in text, it's always good to read widely or look at things widely so you can you can learn from other people and then try to inject your own personal flavor in, into the way that things are presented. Okay, and so also, um, one, one thing, being surrounded by 
very creative uh, artists in our department. Really, it would really inspire you to, uh, you know, be creative. Yes. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. I, mean, I can attest to that. That's why we are coming up with so much work for yeah. you guys. <laughs> <laughs> Your work has is very inspiring for us writers. So now we have another question from Siu Kun on what makes a good infographic? Ha. I've been doing infographics for almost more than three decades and I also hold master classes uh, for, for a class called uh, Visual Journalism in the Digital World and this is uh, quite a common question posed by most of my students. For an infographic to work, I always tell my student, infographic is basically um, just imagine yourself sitting in a kopitiam having a chat with your friend, right? A car bursts into flame in front of Mary Stella, right, the other day, for example. You're not going to say, oh, on Tuesday last week, you know, or whatever, at 8.30 in the morning, a car bursts into flame. Because when you are talking to your friend, you're just saying, a car bursts into flame. And the mother and the child, and, and, and the child told the mom to quickly get out from the car. So actually, infographics is basically a coffee shop talk, right? Okay, so I start from that premise alone. What do people want to see when they turn the page or when they see the, an infographics? They just want to see that. The rest can come in later. A good infographic is actually something that you can understand within five seconds. So to make that happen, you have to decipher everything all the information that you get, crunch it down and make it simple enough that an audience or reader see it and can understand within five seconds. So you can use uh, shapes, color, fonts and so forth. And layout play a very important role in, uh, in deciding that factor too. Uh, and the rest falls into place. So again, like I mentioned, the main focus is the coffee shop talk and the rest falls into place. Uh, but of course, it depends on your audience, right? So if I'm actually doing uh, infographics for um, a cross-section of an incineration plant, of course, I know my audience mm -hmm. is a different kind of audience. So I will try and put as much as I can and explain the whole thing within one glance. But if let's say I'm doing a uh, infographic for let's say primary school students, you know, I will have to do something that appeals to them. Mm. I will have to use simple lines, uh, brighter colors, bigger fonts, and even the captions are even uh, simpler for them to understand. I spend a lot of my time at bookshop looking at books for the kids, you know, how things work, because I find that intriguing. Books that make preschooler understand information graphics, you know, like DK books and so forth, are very interesting. And uh, that's a good basis for anyone who's interested in doing infographics, you know. What about text? I mean, one big quarrel between mm -hmm. artists and journalists is, you guys are giving us too much text. Yes. So what is the... What, how can we, why is too much text no good? I, I know Billy, you are nodding your head in enthusiasm. <laughs> so maybe you can share with us why too much text is not a good idea. Why? Uh, um, <laughs> they, they always say, uh, well, what's the saying? A picture is worth a thousand words. Yeah. So I, I would say that, uh, I mean, to be honest, like, people are getting a bit lazy, uh, to be honest. They would rather look at something nice and fancy than actually reading. So I, I, I believe that if you can express the same idea with visuals, right, it will tend to catch people's attention more. So, I, and I mean, for, for print, I mean, for print infographic, right, I mean, space is limited. Uh, so, you know, if you want to do a visually engaging piece of work, sometimes if the text is too much, you, you tend to have a little bit of problem, uh, yeah. I guess. It, yeah. looks, it looks too cluttered. Correct. But actually, I want to cite one example. Um, in our climate change board game that, was, that ran on Saturday, there was one, one tip that said, recognize that planting new trees is not the same as keeping old ones. And I thought many of you drew the, the graphic perfectly representative of that. You, you showed 
the heroine planting a new plant in the soil but looking mm. back at the big tree behind her. Yeah. Right. So what how what was the creative process behind it? I mean once no, you saw the text. That one it was uh, it was added uh, later on uh, f from someone someone suggested it actually. That's why you have to, you know, re be open to suggestions when uh, working with uh, in a, in a group. Yeah. It helps, you know. Actually so that that's our next question from Chua XR. How do you gather feedback and what metrics do you use to judge your graphics? I think this would apply to all of you. So, who wants to start first? <laughs> okay, what metrics uh, do we use yeah. to judge our artwork? I'm, I'm lucky to be in a company of very talented people over the years, you know. And the, the, the team we have is actually uh, 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 very talented. They, I can actually bounce ideas of them, you know, and they can see things differently from what I see. So we actually uh, powwow quite a lot. So that's one of the metrics. Another one is um, we look at what other newspapers are doing. You know, are there other newspapers who are very good in graphics and illustrations. Okay, we try and see what else can we do. Can we emulate them in certain way? And of course, every year we enter the uh, Society of News Design, which is actually uh, the Oscars of uh, newspaper uh, design, which uh, which have con which has a contest for illustration graphics and so forth and information graphics. And we have won substantial amount of awards. So that actually is a pretty good metrics. Um, we have our in-house guests. Sometimes you know we have. Uh, we have a uh, special guest who come and uh, give talks in uh, ST, and we also, you know, bounce ideas of them. Um, it, the best way is to see what the uh, the good folks are doing out there, the people who are in the know, and you try and uh, uh, base your yardstick closer to them. And I think we are doing a pretty good job. So far, yes. So from other colleagues, through professional networks, yes. to getting inspired by others in this business. Yes. What about from readers or from viewers? Readers' feedbacks are, uh, yes. do help, you know. Sometimes uh, readers' feedbacks will let you know if uh, you're doing uh, right or wrong, you know. Uh, but not all, you know, a positive or negative feedback uh, helps. You know, uh, it, it's uh, it's your barometer of uh, whether you're, you know, you're mm. doing right in your work. So yeah, I think maybe one example for our the climate change board game was someone mentioned that oh maybe we can hold the text a bit longer so people will have time yeah. to read it as the heroine goes by. Yeah. So so I think these are just some some um, mechanisms and then when we share our work on on LinkedIn or social media platforms, you also get good feedback from there. So. Okay, this comes from Ariana and she asks, which styles of artwork do you believe reach beyond the science enthusiast audience? Many. What, what's that again? What's, what's that? What style of artwork do you believe reaches beyond just the science enthusiast audience? What style? I think some, something that's uh, relatable to, to, the, to the young audience, right? I mean, they are the ones who need you know, to see this because they are the future, right? So you ha have to have a, a very um, easy to uh, understand style and also entertaining, mm -hmm. you know, um, s something like that, yeah. I guess maybe one thing to point out is that while sometimes we use cartoons and all that, mm -hmm. they are in no way simplifying or oversimplifying technical concepts and they are still scientifically accurate and scientifically sound. How do we balance that? I think we are currently exploring with uh, yeah. with the boys on how we can use uh, other medium as well. You know, uh, other than cartooning, we actually spoke about using Lego bricks. You know, things that people can relate to. We are use uh, like Billy recently did the uh, 80th anniversary of Wonder Woman using paper cutouts, and it turned out really well. So we are actually exploring all kind of mediums. Um, we're actually thinking of doing something different this time around, not using cartoons, but maybe more, we could use uh, animated typography. We could use a uh, very stylish uh, illustration, very, uh, yeah, uh, yeah. So we are exploring all kinds of avenues because animation is just a vehicle 
but the you know it's just a medium right but the style itself we could actually uh, try out different style you know because cartooning yes on one hand everybody loves cartoons right but we also want to appeal to a uh, different kind of segment based on the topic itself based mm. on the topic yeah yeah and now with all the digital tools at our disposal yes. disposal yeah it's definitely something to consider i i i, I think in this gen uh in the year 2022 right with the there there are so many programs and software that actually facilitate what we do you know uh, you know um that we could not have possibly done a dec uh, a decade ago and the computer are even getting faster now with the new intel chip and the uh, graphics card you know the, and the the possibility and the possibility are endless you look at many using ipad to draw most of his cartoons he can be sitting in a cafe somewhere in you know in orchard road and producing the kind of uh, world class work that we see today so There's still a lot of questions coming in but I think we only have time for one last one. Um so before we end this webinar maybe we could just have each of you talk about what are the challenges that you face in conveying something as abstract as climate change because it's not something you can immediately envision, right? I mean adaptation is is not something that or mitigation uh, uh, they are kind of abstract terms. So how do you guys translate abstract concepts into art? Okay, maybe Billy you go first. abstract concept into art um i guess the best way for me at least is to use like uh what's the word mm, it's like a representation uh, like you try to relate it to something that people can relate to so it's easier for people to understand instead of you you know instead of just honing on to the actual the the idea of it so if you let's say like like many said let's say adaptation he he relate it to a sort of armor so people can get that instead of just you know ad- adaptation mm. kind of thing yeah like just now when we when we had Chris Tim and he drew the mangrove hugging hugging like a little island i think that was yeah. a yeah. very very good way of encapsu- encapsulating an abstract yeah. concept many any tips play with the surrealist uh, concepts sorry surrealist oh. concept it th- helps you know and also just do research and try to understand Uh, thoroughly the message the concept and your audience that will help you uh, visualize what you uh, you know uh, yeah, visualize your message oh yes yeah. I, i see you like surrealism there's yeah. a lot of elements in that in the climate yeah. tunes like the screen visual play mm-hmm. visual play yeah yeah it helps it helps they call it the visual vocabulary you know so you, you have to uh, uh, equip yourself with that Yeah. And how? I think to be a good cartoonist, you have to be exposed to um what 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 I mean by exposed is um you know, I've seen a lot of cartoonists or want to be cartoonists that are afraid of uh, doing things, you know. Um they just sit at home, you know, they scour through the internet on their, you know, their whole life is based on the computer. No, you have to go out there. You have to experience things, you know. You have to try things. look at things if you ever in new york city you know go to the mad you know look at the great renaissance painting and so forth you know those are a treasure trove of ideas you know uh, when you're watching movies you when you're listening to songs you know uh, so the more you are exposed the more um the more you're on the way to becoming a very good cartoonist style is something but i think concept is also yeah. you need to have a very strong concept you know i've seen successful cartoons you know like gary larson for example the far side right his style may be s- simplistic drawing but the concept is so strong that it is a very successful comic uh, so the concept is everything i also want to add that uh, being in a multiracial society like singapore it can be challenging to be a cartoonist because you have to observe the sensitivity of all race. Yeah. So, you know, unlike America where they have a lot of more freedom of speech, more liberal. More liberal. <laughs> Here we have to be careful uh of who we draw and you know, we have made a lot of mistakes sometimes along the way, you know, and 
So we have to observe the, sensi the sensitivity of uh, all races. Yeah. Okay. So thank you very much, Hart, Manny and Billy, for this inspirational discussion. And as they have said, ideas can come from anywhere, so keep your eyes peeled. And thank you to our audience for joining us for this session. A recording of this webinar will be available on the Straits Times website later today. Thank you everyone, stay informed and keep healthy and safe.